Okay, I have 305, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the fourth session of the symposium. Um, my name is Jay Forsyth. I'm an assistant professor at College of Charleston, and um, I'd like to thank you for joining. Um, we have a really great set of three speakers to finish up today. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Luke Lehman, who's an assistant professor at Scripps in California. So, Luke, uh, take it away. All right, thanks, Jay. Um, first, I would like to <clears throat> thank the STUDATH organizers for the opportunity today. It's it's really an honor. Um, so so thanks. And I would also like to thank the entire CCE for support and friendship over the past three years or so, Christine Conwell and Nick Hud especially. And um, I'd like to especially thank the people who are listed here who um, contributed directly to the work I'll be talking about. So this presentation is going to focus on a project exploring the question of how nucleic acids and proteins uh, might have interacted during the origin of life to mutually promote each other's emergence from the soup. Um, as you all know, interactions between proteins and RNA are ubiquitous in biology. And the best example of this, I think, is the ribosome, which is shown here. Uh, this is what the partnership between proteins and RNA looks like after billions of years of coevolution. But we're more interested in what that partnership may have looked like in a messier prebiotic environment during the origin of life. Um, I would say it, it, it's certain that intermolecular interactions influenced prebiotic chemical evolution, and I, I, I think this goes beyond the sort of chicken and egg debate about whether there was a pure RNA world or a protein world or a coevolution world, because regardless of which of those scenarios you favor, um, at, at some point, there must have been productive interactions between protonucleic acids and protopeptides that led to the, the current biological world we know today. <clears throat> so our hypothesis is that uh, there were productive interactions between protopeptides and nucleic acids. But um, how do you go about studying something like that in practice? Where do you start? Uh, how long do the peptides need to be? You know, this came up just in the Q&A just now. Uh, where do you start? And for us, being in the CCE, our starting place was to generate and characterize a collection of cationic protopeptides, which are depsipeptides and peptides. Um, we've heard about this uh, estermediated amide exchange reaction earlier today from Facundo and Martha, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through it in any detail. Um, it's a reaction in which amino acids and hydro hydroxy acids are dried together for a period of time to generate mixtures of peptides and depsipeptides. And for our studies, we wanted to generate cationic protopeptides, uh, ones containing positively charged side chains. Uh, we thought that was the best way to create molecules that might interact with nucleic acids uh, by introducing the potential for a attractive electrostatic interactions. So we investigated a small collection of cationic amino acids and hydroxy acids uh, which are shown on this slide. Um, each amino acid was dried down separately with either glycolic acid or lactic acid um, to generate mixtures of depsipeptides and peptides. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I want to say the question of which cationic amino acids are prebiotically plausible and were available on the prebiotic earth is unresolved, and so we decided to take an agnostic approach. We we used all three of the proteinogenic amino acids, those being lysine, arginine, and histidine, um, along with some, uh, some other cationic amino acids that have been discussed as prebiotically plausible and, and found in meteorites and stimulated prebiotic reaction. Um, we also used the two cationic hydroxy acids that are shown bottom right. Okay, so the first question is, what is the nature of the protopeptides that are generated uh, with these cationic amino acids? Um, at this point, we've dried down these mixtures, and um, we have a complex mixture of depsipeptides and peptides. And now the challenge is to characterize those. 
Um, unlike some of the other mixtures that were, were commonly produced before, um, before our studies, um, in this case, cationic am amino acids can react at two potential sites. There's the alpha amine and the side chain amine. So um, there's a potential for different structures to be formed, and we wanted to characterize them. Uh, so if an amino acid reacts only at the alpha, alpha position, uh, that would give you a topology similar to what we find in biological proteins. Um, if it reacts at the side chain position, that would give you a branch topology. And of course, um, isolation can also occur at, at both positions. And at the outset, I would say I was not very confident that these mixtures would contain much or, or any free amines. Um, I expected a lot of branching and most of the amines to be isolated, which would give oligomers that are um, contain these amino acids but are not cationic. And I thought maybe we could play around with conditions or stoichiometry to help favor the formation of cationic molecules. Um, so uh, shown here is a mass spec. This is just showing you that we generate Depsy peptides. Um, but when we started looking at these and characterizing them by NMR, it gave us a clearer picture of what was going on. And <clears throat> um, really, it gave us a nice surprise. Um, what we found is that dry down reactions of certain of the amino acids gave quite clean conversion to uh, alpha-linked topology similar to what is found in proteins with a free side chain. So shown here is an example for lysine. Um, these resonances correspond to the isolated alpha position. If we integrate that, we see that around 87% of the alpha position is isolated. On the other hand, when you look at the side chain, only 12% of the side chain is isolated. So, so most of the oligomers in this mixture are isolated at the alpha position, but not at the side chain position. And this gives a topology similar to what we find in protein. Now, when we go beyond lysine and look at the rest of the cationic amino acids in our collection, um, there's a rather striking finding, and that is the, the three proteinogenic amino acids are were, were more uh, <clears throat> more efficient at generating this protein-like backbone topology with a isolated alpha position and a free side chain. Um, when you look at the non-proteinogenic amino acids we studied, they were either much less efficient in reacting, or uh, they they had more reaction at the side chain, and, and that's due as we determined through other studies, that's due to uh, cyclization to form uh, intramolecular lactam type structures. So um, we think this finding may inform one of the, the longstanding questions in origins of life research, which is how the proteinaceous amino acids were selected out of the much larger set of amino acids that would have been present um, during the early phases of evolution. Um, this is a, a purely chemical basis that could have contributed to that selection for these amino acids. Um, and as I mentioned, um, this is a, our, our, our chemical rationale for the lower reactivity and regioselectivity of the non-proteinogenic amino acids. So in the case of diaminobutyric acid or ornithine, um, ester formation leads to the possibility of uh, a, 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 a facile intramolecular cyclization to form a lactam, whereas in the case of lysine, that seven-membered ring is, is uh, less favorable to form. Um, there's also the potential that internal hydrogen bonding in the amino acid monomers could uh, lower the efficiency of their reactant. Um, so the, the prediction based on those results is that if you have a mixture of uh, one of these more efficient amino acids and one of these less efficient amino acids, um, that in a mixture of those, the more efficient one would, would outcompete and would preferentially be oligomerized. And so we carried out a number of reactions um, to study that question where uh, two amino acids were mixed with a hydroxy acid. And indeed, 
what we observe is preferential incorporation of the proteinogenic amino acid, in this case lysine, um, over uh, the non-proteinogenic amino acid. Okay, so, so we can produce mixtures of cationic uh, protopeptide oligomers. The next question we explored is, what effect do these mixtures have on RNA folding and stability? Um, so shown on this slide is a summary of the molecules we used to investigate this. Uh, on the bottom of the slide are the different RNA structures we used. Uh, there are three RNA duplexes that differ in length and GC content, and the fourth structure is a, a more complex hairpin-like structure that's taken from uh, helix 26A of the uh, ribosomal RNA. <clears throat> and shown on the top is just a schematic of um, the, the dry-down reactions that I've been describing. Um, so we generate a, a crude mixture of Depsy peptides, which will contain some unreacted monomers. Um, and for some of our experiments, we dialyze these mixtures to remove unreacted monomers and short oligomers uh, just to further support that the effects we were observing were due to the, the oligomers that were present and not unreacted monomers. Okay, so, so here's what we observe when we incubate these samples with RNA. Our readout is the melting temperature of the RNA duplex. This is the temperature at which 50% of the RNA duplex is melted. So a higher melting temperature corresponds to a more stable folded structure. Um, and what we found is that some of these dry down mixtures increase the melting temperature of the duplex, or in other words, made the RNA fold more stable. So in the graph on the left, um, the yellow data point is the observed melting temperature for the amino acid control, which is a sample containing amino acid that was not polymerized. And the, the open circles are melting temperatures observed for the dry down mixture. And you, you can see in, in several cases the, the dry down mixtures promote a higher melting temperature than the amino acid control, although not in all cases. Um, for some of the, uh, the mixtures where there was not efficient oligomerization, as, as you would expect, there's, there's little difference compared to the amino acid control. Um, and similarly, in the dialyzed samples, we can see a, a clear concentration-dependent effect for these oligomers on the melting temperature of the RNA. <clears throat> so um, I, I want to stress that these are non-coded oligomers present as a complex mixture produced in prebiotically plausible reactions with essentially no optimization of conditions. So in some sense, it's not too surprising that cationic oligomers would increase the melting temperature of an RNA. But to me, what this says is that it's not difficult to generate oligomers on the prebiotic earth that could have interacted functionally with uh, protonucleic acids. If certain amino acids and hydroxy acids were dried for a period of time, these results would be a natural consequence. Um, so we found similar results using cationic polyesters. So these oligomers were generated by drying the um, hydroxy acids shown here. This is an analog of lysine. This is an analog of uh, diaminobutyric acid. Um, and again, what we observe is similar to the amino acid, where the shorter side chain underwent that intramolecular cyclization. Here what we observe is uh, polyesters generated with the longer side chain uh, monomer um, do indeed affect and increase the RNA duplex TM, whereas mixture generated from the shorter side chain uh, did not. And we think this is due to the faster degradation of the oligomers with the, the shorter side chain. All right, so in parallel to generating and characterizing Depsy peptides from dry down mixtures, we also took a complementary approach, um, a top down approach synthesizing well defined Depsy peptides as standards and as model compounds. Um, this 
facilitated a, a more controlled study of structure function relationships than would be possible with the, the more complex mixtures. Um, I'm not going to go into any detail, uh, but just to say that we synthesized a library of around 40 cationic peptides and depsy peptides using solid phase uh, approaches. And um, this chemistry, after some optimization, worked really well, I would say. This is an HPLC trace showing uh, the crude product from the synthesis of uh, this 16 mer containing eight ester bonds in the backbone. So <clears throat> having synthesized these model compounds and purified them by HPLC, um, we were able to carry out a series of structure relationship studies, uh, structure function relationship studies, um, like the one shown here. Um, hopefully it's not as fuzzy on your screen as it is on mine. Um, but so um, each of the depsy peptides shown on this slide contains eight peptide bonds and eight ester bonds in a repeating sequence. And in the graph, the, 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 the filled symbols are a peptide and the open symbols are correspond to the depsy peptide. And uh, what we observe is that for the proteinaceous side chains, uh, the effect of the peptide and the depsy peptide on the RNA melting temperature were essentially identical. Whereas um, for these other non-proteinaceous uh, side chains that we examined, while the peptide uh, led to a higher RNA melting temperature, the depsy peptides did not. And again, um, this effect is not due to some inherent problem with the side chains because in the case of the all peptide sequence, they do increase the TM. Um, we, we know by follow-up HPLC studies that the reason for this uh, failure of those um, oligomers is that they were rapidly degrading during the course of the, uh, of the experiments due again to that intramolecular side chain um, cleavage of the backbone. Okay, so uh, protopeptides can increase the stability of RNA folds. And what about the other side of the coin? How do, how are depsy peptides affected by interacting with a nucleic acid? I've uh, mentioned um, depsy peptide hydrolysis or degradation several times throughout the talk. So that was the natural place to examine how interaction with RNA would affect depsy peptides. And <clears throat> so, um, shown on this slide is a simple model for how intermolecular interactions of a depsy peptide with a nucleic acid might affect depsy peptide hydrolysis. So in the model, the, the free depsy peptide is uh, subject to hydrolysis at some pseudo first order rate. Um, the depsy peptide can also bind to a nucleic acid duplex that may be present governed by this equilibrium. And in the complex, there could be a different pseudo first order rate of hydrolysis. So under conditions where this association is favorable and this hydrolysis rate is lower than this one, under those conditions, you would expect the presence of an RNA duplex lower the rate of hydrolysis, the depsy peptide. Um, so, so, so what do we observe when we carry out the reaction. Um, so shown here is a series of HPLC traces showing the extent of depsy peptide hydrolysis <clears throat> um, over different times in the absence of an RNA. Um, when we carry out, all right, when we carry out the same reaction in the presence of an RNA, we observe much slower, dramatically slower rates of uh, Depsy peptide hydrolysis. And we have to go to much longer times to uh, accurately measure um, the, the concentrations of the hydrolyzed Depsy peptide. Um, so <clears throat> here's the data for a series of experiments at different concentrations of the RNA duplex present. So the filled circles here are our HPLC experimental data, and the curves are fits to the model shown on the left using a program called SIMFIT that was developed by 
uh, Gunter von Kondrovsky. Um, so if you look closely at this data, I, I think it's really interesting and it tells us something about the reaction. So um, all of these reactions were run with a depsy peptide concentration of 25 micromoles. And the RNA duplex concentration was varied from, from zero up to the concentrations shown here, all in micromoles. And what you observe is for all the cases where the RNA duplex is uh, stoichiometric or in excess compared to the depsy peptide, so 25 micromolar or greater, the hydrolysis rate are essentially indistinguishable. But as you drop the RNA duplex concentration below 25 micromolar, so now there is um, uh, substoichiometric concentrations of RNA, you start seeing uh, faster hydrolysis of the depsy peptide. And what this tells us is that uh, this reaction is, is, is fast and um, and um, it, and the, the, the equilibrium constant is high so that once the depsy peptide binds um, it is it, essentially protected from hydrolysis so so there's there's two phases now so in these cases you see a, a fast hydrolysis phase until you reach the concentration where the, the Depsy peptide concentration is equal to the RNA duplex concentration. And then there's a second phase of slow hydrolysis that, that matches this, uh, the, the rate shown here. Um, so in the spirit of the talks given yesterday, dealing with alternatives to RNA and heterogeneous backbones, I, I think it's worth examining interactions between Depsy peptides and various alternative nucleic acids that, that could have been present on prebiotic earth. And we don't have any data along those lines yet, but we have looked at the reaction in the presence of uh, duplex DNA or single-stranded RNA. And I think it's really interesting that uh, whereas a duplex DNA does protect the, RNA, the depsy peptide from hydrolysis, it, it's not as much as the duplex RNA. And single-stranded RNA is is even worse. So could it be possible that folded RNA is um, in some sense a, a privileged structure? I think that term was used last night in the, the round table. Is, is RNA a privileged structure for uh, protecting protopeptides or, or binding to protopeptides and reducing their rate of degradation? I think that's a very intriguing question and um, something that is worthy of further study. Um, so, putting this all together, I, I think this single experiment nicely illustrates the potential of interactions between protopeptides and RNA. Um, in this reaction, uh, we, we prepared three different uh, samples, one that had RNA alone, one that had depsy peptide alone, and one contained both RNA and depsy peptide. So we incubated for those for some period of time, and then we quantified depsy peptide hydrolysis and measured the extent of uh, duplex that was left. And what we observe is in the reaction that only had RNA, um, the, the percent folded structure or percent hybridized was only around 10%. Now we, we chose conditions because we knew in the absence of RNA, um, it would be un, unfolded under, under these conditions, but you know, I think that's fair because there would have been a range of various different conditions on the early Earth. Um, in the case where the depsy peptide was alone, uh, after this time period, the depsy peptide had essentially completely hydrolyzed. But in this third reaction where the depsy peptide and RNA were present together, what you observe is the depsy peptide is still around 80% present. Uh, because it, it, it has a much slower rate of hydrolysis, and it's binding to the RNA and increasing its duplex melting temperature, so the RNA is folded. Um, and, you know, I, I think um, at, the, at the outset, um, we started not really knowing how this was going to go, but um, I think we're very excited about these results, and potential um, 
potential um, potential things that they could say about selection of uh, RNA and pep peptides or DEPSI peptides on the early Earth. So um, protopeptides produced in a, a, a single simple drying step can engage in direct interactions and mutually promote folding uh, and stability. I, I, th I think that's an intriguing result. Um, so on my last slide, I just want to reflect on what I see as one of the real legacies of the CCE, and that is promoting the idea of alternative or heterogeneous backbones in origins of life research. Um, historically, in prebiotic peptide chemistry, the, the focus has been only on peptide backbones. And um, I, I have to say that at first, when I joined the CCE, I, I was only interested in DEPSI peptides as a possible stepping stone to peptides on early Earth. And, you know, this is sort of how Nick and Ram described DEPSI peptides yesterday as, as an intermediate on the way to peptides. And that makes sense because DEPSI peptides are easier to synthesize and can increase in amino acid content with cycling. So it's easy to imagine some sort of takeover occurring. But in working with DEPSI peptides over the past couple of years, I would say I've had a change of heart. And DEPSI peptides are different than peptides. They have different solubility properties. They have different folding properties, much different dynamics of formation and degradation. And if you believe that peptides were present on early Earth, by simple logical extension, I think you have to also agree that DEPSI peptides were present. And um, taking those two things together, I think it's reasonable to argue that DEPSI peptides deserve to be studied on their own right, not just as a stepping stone to peptides. Maybe they were a stepping stone, but even if not, they're fascinating and they have a rich chemistry that we're only beginning to understand in terms of prebiotic chemical evolution. Okay, with that, I'd like to, again, thank the CCE for support and friendship. Um, and I'd like to thank the, the organizers for the opportunity to speak here today.